Good afternoon and welcome to Ad Talks, hosted by Campus Consortium. The purpose of Ad Talks is to facilitate thought leadership in the education community. Today's session is part of our 2020 series. We have asked our guest speaker to share with us his thoughts on what education will look like in 2020 and how will information technology evolve to meet the needs of students, faculty, and the administration. I would like to extend a warm welcome to today's guest speaker, Mr. Philip Long, Chief Innovation Officer and Associate Vice Provost for Learning Sciences at the University of Texas at Austin, a Campus Consortium member. Phil is one of the driving forces behind Project 2021, a UT Austin strategic initiative aimed to align the university towards education innovation research informed teaching and learning, and an optimal and lifelong student experience. In addition to his work on Project 2021, Phil provides leadership to the university's strategy for technology enhanced learning, including UTX, the local implementation of EDX, MOOCs, the UT Learning Analytics Initiative, and the design of learning environments. Phil, we have about uh, 100 attendees today from across the country. On behalf of our team and the attendees, we thank you for taking the time to share with all of us your thoughts and insights around the future of technology and education. Without further ado, I'd like to pass the platform over to you, Phil. Thank you very much, Bob, and welcome everyone to uh, the Campus Consortium webinar for this afternoon. And uh, I look forward to uh, seeing some of the questions emerge in the chat box. Uh, and uh, I would like to give you a sort of a sense uh, in the next uh, half an hour or so of where we at the University of Texas are um, making some efforts to rethink the undergraduate uh, curriculum. So I hope that um, in doing so, you, you, the context for this is understood that we are responding to um, the vision and incentive of our president, Greg Fenvis, to really th rethink at the University of Texas the undergraduate education. Um, before I get started, but let me just thank Annie and Roger and Anji and of course Bob for the opportunity to do this with you and uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Next slide please. And hopefully we can get to the next slide. Thank There we go. So um, there's a lot of talk in the blog sphere at conferences and elsewhere about the conservative and traditional nature of the academy. And campuses are conservative institutions. It's one of our roles to, be, to critically consider, investigate, and evaluate disciplinary topics, including how they go about teaching. The process of doing research, whether it's investigating the Higgs boson or determining if a new pedagogical practice actually makes a difference and is faster, cheaper, and better, uh, takes time. And it involves humans, not particles. And as a consequence, it's always a complicated process to take uh, to carry out. Faculty are, are also, at many institutions like UT Austin, um, research intensive enterprises. The pursuit of that research agenda is considered one of the benefits students receive in, from attending such institutions as an undergraduate. And whether that's really true or not can be questioned, and that should be. But the reality imposed by that is that faculty rewards are often skewed towards the research productivity end of the spectrum. And the responsibility for other activities like teaching can sometimes get less attention. Finally, there's a strong accountability movement around uh, that you're all aware of that is pressing all of us, particularly public institutions, uh, to be more efficient, effective, and contribute better to our economies wherever we happen to be located. And unfortunately, some of the metrics, like the four-year graduation rate, um, which are well-meaning and important, are also extremely easy to measure and dominate our attention. I wish we had simple measurements for progress in better teaching. But learning is a bit more complicated than a throughput measure, and so that makes our challenge a bit steeper. Next slide, please. The 
the truth is, is that most institutions from community colleges and technical colleges on up to the most research intensive institutions, there is a deep culture of innovation. Individual and faculty, individual faculty and occasionally small teams or research groups do remarkable experiments on learning and learning outcomes. The biggest challenge is the, that this is distributed in a cauldron of, of, of innovation and across the campuses led by faculty or by carefully, who are carefully selected as entrepreneurs. You couple this with the complexity of research and the research process, particularly at large uh, institutions and the systemic changes that they are actually addressing. And it seems that there isn't the kind of broad scale impact that one would like, but there is lots of innovation going on all around us. Layer on to that, the previously mentioned uh, pressure to produce disciplinary research and not to disrupt the interlocking systems that make up the modern university and progress slows further. So we need to really consider how do we take about, go about this process um, using the very disciplinary tools that we as researchers apply to our disciplines. And in that process, recognize that we tend to be overly cautious and careful about extrapolating our findings beyond carefully designed experiments. But nevertheless, we need to speak up more broadly and more loudly. So let me talk for a moment, next slide please, about Project 2021. <clears throat> At the University of Texas, innovation and teaching and learning and technology have been a part of the DNA of the institution for generations. Yet we too are struggling with the increasing rates of technological change in society and business and even in the social integration of technology around us uh, in our lives. We at Texas, at this institution in particular, are a large organization and scale is sometimes something that can be beneficial, but it makes institutional change a bit like turning a battleship. You know what's happening, but it takes a long time to complete the turn. Hence, uh, our president challenged the institution to rethink undergraduate education, and Project 2021 is the vehicle that was created to guide that uh, activity. It's led by Professor Jamie Pennybaker and a supporting team, and includes elements that had been part of a cast of characters that were working in the advancing and support of the undergraduate enterprise in the past, but now with a slightly refocused and um, new emphasis. So. We're going about this process over a five-year horizon. The intention isn't that in five years we'll be done. The intention instead is that the focused effort will become an institutionalized process during that time and the organization that is known now as Project 2021 will be a transient footnote. Next slide, please. So we have a mission and the mission is relatively straightforward. We need to think about redefining what courses mean. It's not just the vernacular of an institution, but it's also the box that often frames all discussion of teaching practice. But it's that box that needs reconsideration, both in duration, depth, methods of engagement, and the interdisciplinarity of the processes that take place within it. We have a fixed calendar, every institution does, but there is no tablet from any mount or capital that necessarily dictates an unchangeable 16-week interval called a semester. Clearly, there are various rules and such that define semesters, and you may be in an institutional context where there is uh, some kind of legislative or other guideline that sort of marks that, uh, that time period, but even those can be changed. In the spirit of backwards design, we have to ask our students what it is we want them and they want to become. What experience are necessary to help them get there? And how do we know we've made a difference when we try something new and that we think might be better? That's what we're now asking ourselves when we consider re rethinking the curriculum. And finally, we have our traditional thought of the primary target of the institution as the undergraduate experience. That's been what our mission has been about. But we know that the world is changing rapidly. The expectation for the US workforce is something on the order of 10 to 15 different jobs in the working lifetime of the average worker. 
They will need retraining, expansion of skills, or simply top-ups periodically to ensure that they can continue to be effective in their changing work lives. And in that light, then, we must reconsider our need for a perpetual learning environment, episodic as it might be. And as universities, we need to consider adapting to deliver value in this new context. It raises a simple question as to whether or not the whole concept of alumni is in fact past to choose by date. Next slide, please. So we have some longer term goals um, in Project 2021. These longer term goals involve simply, generally speaking, improving the student experience, increasing faculty engagement, extending the reach of the working engagement with the university across the lifespan of the new learner, and in the process, rethinking the financial models that can sustain our expanded responsibilities. Uh, financing issues will continue to recur as we go through this discussion and as you will run into when you consider disrupting the apple cart. Next slide, please. We must do this process using what makes the academy unique. We are researchers and scholars. We approach things from a framework of asking questions, seeking ways to answer them, collecting information to do that, and sharing it with our peers and discussing it. We need to ask what metrics characterize a good class. We need to define valuable and rewarding college experiences. And we need to do this with data, qualitative and quantitative, but with data. It's time to move beyond the survey and the anecdotal conversation describing wonderful experiences we've had and yet have no idea how to replicate them. Next slide, please. And there are barriers. These are barriers that will be uh, ones that are, I'm sure, reminiscent in your own context. And I'd look forward to hearing if you have more of them to add. But we have ways of doing things, and our systems are multiple, complex, and interlocking. Many changes in teaching and learning have ripple effects that have impact on administrative practices, departmental policies, um, that challenge existing student expectations, and in some cases make a ang alumni angry for changing the experience they fondly remember and feel being threatened by or diminished by whatever new approaches are being per um, uh, pro uh, pursued. Our systems are entrenched, and there are many local reasons for why they are locally optimized. At least that's what we say and why they persist. And we have an uneven technology infrastructure that may impede new technology-enabled teaching practices, certainly the case here at UT Austin. Sometimes these are large cost items which are hard to change, and um, they're even harder when the reason to do so is based on possible opportunities, not proven facts. In our case, we have a student information system that's 40 plus years old, for example. It was built and exists without even a relational database behind it because when it was designed, there was no such thing. Next slide. So at UT, we often think of these constraints in, uh, in a summary context with the three big ones being the three C's. And I'm betting you have similar ones uh, yourselves. For us, the constraints of the current uh, project uh, activities fall around the definition of credit, the current process by which we assemble courses in, into majors and into our playbook, which we call the catalog, and finally, the tyranny of the calendar, a seemingly immovable, slow-ticking heartbeat that defies reconsideration. At UT Austin, we have one calendar. That is one calendar for what we refer to as the long semesters, the primary spring and fall semesters. Not three, not four, one. That is a problem. Next slide, please. When we consider credit, one of the concerns is how to count it. We have a system built on credits at UT Austin as integer values. That may seem trivial, just change it. 
but it has vast implications. First of all, RSIS, as I mentioned, is a bit old. We've had terrific return on investment on it. In fact, it's a homegrown system. But with its 40-year-old age, we have, in fact, credit allocations counted as integer numbers. Not rational numbers, integer numbers. We've looked into what it's going to take to turn that into something that we can do with fractional credit. And it turns out it's going to take us about four to five months and a couple of developers, roughly a quarter million dollars to make that change. It's doable, of course. We've written this system. We can do anything we want with it. But it's not trivial. But more to the point, changing the credit hours changes our calculations of lots of other things, like faculty load or the duration of a course. The accounting of credits is used internally to mark progress towards a degree. It is nearly useless as a measure of what students have learned, and from the vantage point of employers, is relatively opaque. The accumulation of this list of credits, the transcript, is important for reporting, it's important for financial aid, and for a whole lot of other valuable things. It's just lousy as a record of learning. And semantically, it's a barren statement of what the student knows or can do. Next slide, please. So when you look at the typical catalog, and this is a snapshot of the University of Texas catalog, you see an accumulation of courses uh, in the course catalog. It takes generally, in our process, 12 to 24 months to make a change to the catalog. The process was automated technically years ago. The process by which we follow the steps for doing this hasn't changed in quite some years. And as you can see, if you can click to the build, please, it doesn't actually convey all that much to anyone. A description of the course catalog can, might appear off to the side. If, uh, if you can do the click, that would be helpful. And it may be elaborated in some institutions more than others, but basically it lists the credit value, who's teaching the course and when, and not too much else. And then there's the when part again, that bloody calendar. We have the calendar that is essentially hacked all the time because one calendar in a complex institution can never work, but it is a hack. Why do we need six week, why can't we use six week courses or even three week courses? But it gets complicated and not just because of the class scheduling, you don't often need uh, rooms for some of these shorter courses. They might be self-paced or based, uh, advanced based on competencies. They might be experiential or project oriented. But nevertheless, for us, they're almost always 16 weeks. Some faculty will say this is, this is what distinguishes a trade school or being more elitist, um, distinguishes the upper tier institutions from those uh, uh, community colleges and polytechs, et cetera. And I've, I've heard faculty say, you know, we have to let our students marinate in the subject and a minimum marination time is 16 weeks. Really? sounds an awful lot like self-justification to me. Next slide, please. So at UT Austin, we're engaging in what we call waging the quiet revolution. We can't approach this head on or top down or in any other mandate fashion. We are an institution of higher education. We have to use what we have and what it makes us the extraordinary institution that we are. We have to think like scholars and attack the problem with the same explore, exploration and open-mindedness that we apply to our disciplinary research. And we have to do this with our faculty, not imposed on our faculty. Next slide, please. One of the things we've been exploring at some depth is how do we actually leverage our scale. At UT Austin, we have the benefit of scale in many uh, circumstances. We have about 51,000 students on the main campus. Uh, we have a class, first-year class size of about 8,650, or there it was at least this year. It is a relatively competitive school to get into because we have something that uh, now is referred to as a 7% rule, which means by legislation we have to take the top 7% 
of the students graduating from the public high schools in the state of Texas. Um, and so our first year courses are both large and largely uh, selected based on that ranking. We've explored this and tried to turn it to our advantages in some sense by turning the problem on its head and asking the question, how large can we make a class and still have it as an active learning class with student collective engagement with small discussions, etc. So that the student feels like they're still in the front row of the, in, of the course. So we've defined what we call our synchronous massive online courses. They're not open, so the extra O is removed because they are registered for the students at the institution, and they are primarily for, since we are a residential institution, the residential students. So let's take a look and see if we can make this work. If you can click to the next slide and start a short little video, I hope you can get a sense of how this There's a lot of feedback. Can we get rid of that? We are in the painting studio. How yeah. are you more nervous than me? Welcome. I'm Professor Shaw. It's not Professor McDaniel. Welcome to In the News for Merritt Mid Texas Government. Jamie, um, where are you? Hi, Sam. I'm uh, right here in Lima, Peru. So I did this experiment before um, with a similar class, right? And indeed, we saw a very similar outcome. Let's go to that survey now, and we're going to get your feedback on why you think the girls are laughing. And so these are the class, uh, the class wide feedback. So these are aggregated like across clear. all the students. It's so let's clear. say we put our system in the That's center, fine. and we'll just put a big box around it. Okay, so here's your system. What do we look like? So 78% of you said yes, the U.S. is the indispensable nation, and 22% of you said no. Hi, this is Dr. Bradbury with another edition of your self-care toolkit. Today, I'm here with a whole bunch of cuteness. That strategy, given what player A is doing, is to confess. I would say half of the chat room has been asking about one question on the homework. But you're saying out of him, uh, <laughs> yeah, representing Dev in kind of a sense. We have turned our lab into a lab slash cafe. So while that might have been a bit of a staccato presentation, it's a flashback uh, to a prior time when um, we were thinking about using the um, television as the mode of delivery. But what we have done is combine that synchronous video distribution with short mini lectures with a suite of different interactive tools. And the suite of different interactive tools involves obviously polling tools and the like, but we have tools that will break a course that may be up to 2,000 or 2,200 students into chat rooms of 8 to 10, monitor those chat rooms in real time with some active software bots that are looking at the distribution of how students, for example, are engaging with each other, and injecting messages, for example, if that engagement is asynchronous or rather yeah, not distributed evenly. We know that for um, research or from research that teams that are uh, engaging in conversation more uh, equally as opposed to being dominated by one or two members of the of the conversation of the uh, chat room uh, are more effective. And so a chat bot actually is in real time measuring the distribution of those conversations and injecting a message if it looks like it's uh, asymmetric. We have other chat bots that are looking at semantic expressions in the context of the, of, the, um, of the chats that are being used and in so doing looking for particular things that indicate, for example, that the students are talking about the weekend football game and not about the subject at hand and then once again injecting a note saying get back on target. So we're using some advanced technology to manage those uh, interactive sessions and yet 
trying to do so in a synchronous fashion because we find that the first year students are young and that the pattern and pacing of a course um, is something that is important to their success. We've been analyzing the results. You see a slide in front of you of an analysis from a, uh, the original set of courses from psychology, and you're looking at their grade point average relative to the same instructors teaching the same topic uh, course material in the lecture format versus the SMOC format, broken down by socioeconomic status. And in that, one of the dramatic things you see is that the, the benefit for the students in the lowest socioeconomic status is the greatest, uh, slightly lesser so for the students in um, the middle SES category, and slightly, uh, and, but still pronounced, and still pronounced, uh, but again, not as dramatic as in the low SES for the upper SES. Next slide, please. In this case, we're looking at the non-psych courses, um, again, fall semester courses. Now, it's not quite as dramatic, although they are still significant differences, particularly in the lower SES category. Um, the, I think, we believe at least, the difference between the non-psych courses and the rest is simply because this innovation stemmed from research in the psych department. And as a consequence of that, um, some of the more subtle aspects of teaching methods we're discovering that are in fact meaningful need to be better conveyed to the other faculty from the other disciplines who are also adopting and taking this uh, teaching mode forward. Professor Penny Baker, for example, who is leading Project 2021, but also is one of the innovators in this space, um, uses frequent testing in his particular class. But it turns out frequent testing means more than just asking a lot of uh, quiz questions periodically. It's the regularity and pervasiveness of the quizzing that seems to matter. And we're doing more research on that topic. Next slide, please. And finally, an interesting note is to see what happens in the spring semester. Again, these are first-year students, so we're not talking about second, second term. A and you'll see that there's still a strong SES improvement for the low category of socioeconomic status, but lesser so for the um, for the high SES. In fact, it's indistinguishable at that point. No significant difference there. And what we're finding is that as a consequence of these analyses, that the students in the lower S SES bracket um, find the regularity and the structure and the approaches with interactivity interspersed with uh, short mini lectures and the like continuing to be valuable in their uh, pursuit of um, the actual uh, performance in class, but the upper divisions, upper SES students essentially have started to figure it out. And when we look at second year students in this context, we see that there is largely no significant difference. So it looks like the students have made the transition to learning in the university uh, at that point, and the structured um, scaffolds that we've put into this process become of diminishing significance going ahead. Next slide, please. So this approach, as I mentioned before, is a bottom-up approach. It's a truism that faculty like cats can't be herded. Rather, they have to discover and integrate the ideas in their own ways with support, both in process and incentives, to make it worth their while. This means that in parallel with other activities, we must engage with the academic leadership to ensure that, the, that we address putting incentives in place that actually represent our values. How do we do this? Well, it may vary from institution, or rather does vary from institution to institution, because it's a very culturally specific set of activities, and so there is no formula other than attending to that reality and, addre and addressing it for your particular circumstance. Next slide, please. Our approach has been to look for tipping points. It, in a ch any change process, um, we think that opening up the teaching process to credit designations other than three and five credit 16-week choices is one of those tipping points for us. Naturally, this means addressing how the building blocks of a major are constructed, since it's not just a matter of changing the order of three credit courses on a page. 
it has helped to present data to our departments about the jobs their students actually are getting when they leave the institution. Most faculty see their students moving on to graduate school and that what they're doing in a research institution like ours is preparing the next cohort of the professoriate. As odd as that may sound, some department chairs are actually shocked when they see that most of their students aren't applying to graduate school. In fact, they aren't following their footsteps at all. We're fortunate in Texas in that we have a relatively good tracking system for post-university employment. And it's particularly detailed when that employment is within the state. But we've recently been able to uh, get some data from the National Census Office, and that gives us some aggregate data for our students that leave Texas to go to other places for work. And this leads to a really important set of honest discussions with faculty about who they are becoming and what experiences they need to be valuable in that context. Next slide, please. Of course, we're extending this to different uh, modes of teaching, expanding different approaches, and systematically trying to measure carefully what those impacts are. We're looking at different ways of grading, uh, and, and more generally speaking, recognizing achievement, which I'll talk about in a minute. We're looking at ways that which we can do things to lower the cost for students, so we reduce their anxiety and debt load as a consequence. Uh, that includes uh, recent efforts to engage in consortial relationships with uh, publisher aggregators to diminish costs for student textbooks, uh, more extensive use of open educational resources, and looking at selected distance interactions for uh, students, particularly those who are doing um, uh, projects and activities away from the institution. And then there is the major push that comes from the president himself here, which is to pursue ex forms of experiential learning. Next slide, please. All of this takes resources, including our feedback to the departments. Analysis of course evaluations, and, an, and in our case, looking at how to make the course evaluation actually useful is one of those things that we've been looking at carefully. The resulting scores faculty receive in course evaluations are used in many ways in an institution. And we really need to revise how we go about this process to get useful feedback. This aligns with the incentives because one of the major issues in any innovation process is that during change you're likely to find things initially don't work as well as, as you'd like the first few times out. We need to provide pr protection to faculty and departments and deans so that they can innovate without fear that the traditional metrics will simply register that things aren't doing as well as they were last time. In part, that's because change may not be captured um, the, actually, the instruments for measuring the course information at the end of a semester won't be capturing necessarily the changes that we're, act, that we're implementing, and in part because change is ragged, and it does improve with iteration. We know we have a great faculty. We know that they won't let a course go pear-shaped because something isn't working. They won't slavishly follow a new teaching process if they can see for themselves it isn't working. They'll deviate and make whatever plan they need to ensure students learn what they need to learn. That's what good faculty do. So in a sense, we see that there's really little risk for students. What we need is a way of putting that protective bubble so that there's little risk for faculty or lesser risk for faculty. And we need to measure what matters in the context of these new changes we're putting in place, which the existing course information surveys often overlook. Next slide, please. And the biggest resource that any institution has is every year's crop of freshman students and, by extension, the students themselves. And so we need to enlist the students in this process. One of the things we're doing in our particular instance is looking at the extraordinary resource that students represent in the context of reconsidering the transcript. As I mentioned before, this is a document of record uh, for students at the university. It's also noted that it says pre uh, precious little about the experiences that really matter to them while they're there. 
So we're enlisting them in a process to help them rethink with us how they wish their time in the university is represented. We're following on some terrific work I can point you to at the University of Michigan and their academic innovation group led by Tim McKay and others, and in partnership with their office of the registrar. And therefore, next slide please. <clears throat> We're using this to design a representation of the student experiences from their perspective. And so literally it is a design jam. So in the design jam, what we're doing is, next slide please, giving them an opportunity to get some context uh, from how a curriculum is put together. Uh, this actually is a tool that I built at a prior institution, or rather helped support the building of at a prior institution um, in Australia uh, called JourneyMaker. And it looks at various attributes of um, the learning process, the domains, the level of attainments we're trying to achieve, context and complexity. All of these things lead into what is listed there as the intended learning outcomes. The intended learning outcomes have to be realized through actual teaching practices and pathways, and so methods like active learning or direct intervention or self-paced, self-directed learning or whatever are the filters through which that intended set of learning outcomes uh, are achieved and lead to the so-called curriculum as designed. And finally, that's what it's supposed to, supposed to happen. Then we actually get in front of students and, and teach. And so that's the curriculum as delivered, which is the academic staff interpretation of all of that material. And then, of course, the last element of this is the curriculum as it's experienced by the students. In each of these steps, we need to measure what's going on, what works, and what doesn't. In the design jam, we're going to be sitting down with our students, giving them some context of, uh, about how curriculum is built and how courses and experiences are built from the university's perspective. And then we're going to step back and say what matters to the student is what we're really trying to capture. That may be things that are traditional academic uh, experiences. It is likely to include a lot of things that might be on the co-curricular side or in that gray area between. We would like them to represent the, what those things might look like, taking advantage of their familiarity with and facility with digital tools, and give us a picture of what a, a transcript of the future might look like from their perspective. I think this is really important because one of the things that we're starting to recognize is that the recognition of learning is one of the things that we can do better at describing, at pointing evidence to that represents what a particular level of achievement looks like and giving transparent access to attributes of these um, uh, note components of the recognition of learning that an employer might find useful in making decisions about who amongst the hundreds of people in their application queue are worth the interview. Next slide, please. So this recognition of achievement, I want to emphasize a little more, is promoting recognition of the learning itself that is supporting an identity construction because to, particularly today, students see the world through their identity and it's a process of building and finding and representing their identity that's driving both their work in college as well as their work as a productive citizen. Recognition of achievement also extends to organizations. It extends to differences by location in the world, countries, and is a process of trust and empowerment. Next slide, please. One of the things that we often overlook, particularly as academics, is what's worth recognizing. And it's less than you may think and more than a number. And I say that because we often go through this process and think about recognition of learning and we start to think of learning outcomes and various things and can get carried away and have 50 to 100 learning outcomes for a given course, which is terrific, may be instrumentally useful from the faculty perspective in terms of designing the activities of the course, but in terms of actual recognizing it in a way that shares it with an audience, it's overkill. And so we really have to think about what's worth sharing, what has context-independent value. That is, you don't have to know the particular instructor, you don't have to know the syllabus, you don't have to know when in the course this particular 
activity of learning that's being recognized took place and its context, et cetera. And that's an important element in guiding this process that we're going through. And in our particular case, we're experimenting with recognition of learning through the formalization of that in terms of um, what is sometimes referred to as badges or micro-credentials. Next slide, please. And that's where we stand at the moment. That is, uh, the summary I'd like to leave you with is we are in a process that is a journey that is looking at changing the student undergraduate experience by recognizing that that experience extends beyond the four years and it really is episodically recurring over a lifetime. It, it's in doing so by looking at what it is we can examine that can actually be done with data collected that tells us whether things work or not and recognize that by and large the kinds of changes we're going to be able to make are probably small and can only be seen if we do very careful experiments at scale. We're trying to leverage a particular characteristic of our campus, which is our size, and consider how we can do very large courses in the early first year, and in the process, both provide at least as good, if not better, instruction from what the uh, format had been in the past, but also the economics of doing it in that way allow us to actually take the savings that we've achieved in that delivery method and apply them to the subsequent years to try to get greater interaction and project experiential activities embedded in the curriculum in those second, third, and fourth years. And finally, we're doing this in the context of initiating a process that we hope will become instantiated. And then as the battleship turns, the momentum will keep it going and will build into our systems of, of support and record the, um, the methods that we are piloting now. And with that, I'll be happy to take questions. Grateful. We have a question from the audience that's from Jacqueline McDonald from Widener University. She'd like to know, how would you change semester definition, division, without affecting financial aid? Thank you. Uh, that's a, good, a great question. Um, and you're right that financial aid has been the, the bugbear for um, particularly those interested in competency-based approaches uh, since they have a calendar uh, definition. It turns out that there is um, a lot of opportunity to make changes in duration of courses um, because they can end within the 16 weeks of the traditional calendar. Um, the challenge is if you, if you slide essentially the window arbitrarily um, and begin at an arbitrary time and end at an arbitrary time, that's when it gets to be difficult. And that's when it requires negotiation um, uh, with the folks at the feds that many of us are trying to engage in now, although that seems to be a bit in hiatus at the moment. Um, but what we found is that uh, for example, we have a course, uh, a new program that's starting that's going to try seven-week uh, course lengths. And we're going to stack them one after another. From the traditional calendar perspective, the course begins in week eight um, for the second semester part of it, and the first course begins at week one. Um, we can go about that process, and uh, we've already gotten clearance that since we're actually working within the sort of overall 16-week chunk, that's a reasonable thing for us to do. Um, as I said, when you slide the scale of the window of the semester into an arbitrary beginning start and stop time, that's when the feds get uh, concerned with respect to financial aid. At least that's been our experience. Thank you, Phil, for answering that. Uh, and that's a thank you from Jacqueline as well. We've got audiences who are asking us for the recording of the session and also of the presentation. And we said that we'll, we'll be releasing this on our website and social media forums. Phil is also part of a future FIT in education group. You can also chat with him over there if you have any questions for him. Um, so just before we let you go and before we wrap up, I think, you know, uniformly what I've seen with people coming to the sessions, one of the core questions that they have is, if you had to define the future of IT and education in just a single line, what would you say? Well, I think the, the, um, the, the crux of the future of IT is really going to focus on um, 
personalization and the ability to deliver using IT tools that learning not only within the institution but uh, when they leave the institution. The biggest change that I see coming down the, the pipe, which is actually a pretty radical one, is that the tools that we think of as the institution's uh, delivery mechanisms are going to be things that the students need to have in some fashion with them for a lifetime. Now that doesn't necessarily mean the institution is going to have an enrollment that simply grows uh, in, in from where we are now to, to an unending enrollment of tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of students. Rather it means that the IT tools that we build are going to be ones that the students can take with them. We're already starting to see that in um, uh, development that's going on in some of the large players like Microsoft and Google. Um, I think we're going to start to see that increasingly as time moves forward. Thank you so much, Phil, for your time today and also for answering all those questions. And thank you for all who've joined us today for Ed Talks, the Future of IT and Education, hosted by Campus Consortium. A link of today's recording will be posted on the Campus Consortium web and social media sites. We hope today's session has been informative and insightful. And like usual, Campus Consortium has always been uh, running these forums to impart uh, student retention, you know, I seminars, best practices learned, lessons by seminars, and also drive forces of thought leadership at the universe, you know, at, at for the future of IT and education. And for those who are looking for any kind of assistance that we could be there to help you impart this, we do offer grant programs where you could leverage uh, technology at this kind of rate or uh, with small little fundings from uh, campus consortium to aid these uh, these strategic IT goals. If you need any other questions or any, um, if you need, if you want to know how to apply for the grant program, you can simply visit our site or email us at info at campusconsortium.org. Uh, that's it from our site. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Phil, once again for your valuable thoughts and inputs. We we'll look forward to seeing you in some session sooner. Take care. Have a great day. Cheers.